So we just uh, CO two is working now. Hey, look at this. Use the CO two to give ourselves a, a, a burn similar to when we uh, drink soda and burp. Yeah. Here. You know that feeling like when you're like burping. So, yep, there it is. Ow. <laughs> Ow. Mm hmm. Ow. I just had some soda. There you go. I don't know why I did that for the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I am off to get gas cylinders from Central Welding so that we can do gas mixes. One of the kind of important things to do with my research is actually to be able to mix gases, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide to represent different kinds of atmospheres and, and bubble that into the water to get different CO2 concentrations, different oxygen concentrations. So I am off to get those gas cylinders now. So I done messed up and tightened the fitting too tightly on my pump and the crap. So now I get to have fun and take it off and epoxy it. So I took the housing off. There's the crack. Now to mend it. So I done epoxy this housing to the pump that I broke and hopefully it works good. It kind of looks a little pretty, maybe not. Fingers crossed. What? You're my heroine. You're my yeah. heroine. Isn't that like a female like Drew? It is, but... It's not our fault they named the drug after it. It's a good word. Well, I'm just saying it could mean a couple different things. <laughs> um... <laughs> What's that? Baby CO2. Baby CO2? What about? Okay, I want, let's take one of those into the respirometry lab and then two of them into the, um, the tank lab. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I'll grab this one. So gas is set up. This is what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the mass flow controllers. We don't have the oxygen mass flow controller, but we do have nitrogen and we do have CO2. So I can do a specific mix between nitrogen and CO2. Open the door. Yeah, let's open the door. <laughs> we'll get lightheaded. <laughs> so, um, we're, just, we're breathing in here though, too, so that also is contributing to CO2 concentration. So, CO2 in from here into here, and then comes back out here, and then we have a um, serial port here that we hook up, and then that goes into the box, this box, okay. which then we have these for, and then this goes to the computer and we control how much this then controls how much gas gets through. Um, okay. Yeah, and then what we do then is we have one for oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, so we can make essentially an air mix of whatever oxygen we want or CO2 we okay. want or whatever. So, right. Yeah. So I'm super stoked because the tide is low and that means that we can go find some cool critters. Hopefully some crabs for our octo friends. How exciting is that though? Low tide and not anyone there. This whole area is like literally filled and crawling with crabs. You can kind of just see them. I don't know if you see them. Let's see. All over. Let's just say I don't think, oh wow, I don't think our octos will be going hungry ever. So many options. So many crabs. Hey, little guy. Just a lot of little ones. Here we go. Getting some for the Octos. So this year, unlike last year, where last year we had CO2 treatments at 700 parts per million and 1500 parts per million, which is a bit high um, if you consider what most of the ocean is. Most of the ocean is about 400 parts per million at the surface of carbon dioxide. 
And what we have in the Puget Sound is actually a bit high. It's like 700, 750 parts per million, which is really high. In fact, that's what we think most of the ocean is going to be like uh, sometime during the next century. So what we were doing last year is having 700 as kind of our, our control tanks, which is what we were pulling the octopuses out of, and a 1,500 part per million treatment, which is kind of maybe future Puget Sound. What we're doing this year is actually doing the 700, and we're going to be reducing the CO2 in some of the tanks, getting it down to like about 400 what the rest of the ocean's at, and seeing how do they do in that. Do they do better? Do they actually lose their adaptation to the high CO2? So we actually need to get the CO2 lower than what it is in the water. We're going to do that by bubbling. Before we do that, we need to calibrate our, and make sure that our method of spectrophotometrically, so like adding a dye to water and measuring pH, that our students can do that accurately. And one way that we're doing that is I am bubbling set gas mixes into some seawater here, and bubble, bubble, bubble. And we are seeing if now, now that I know exactly what the CO2 is bubbling in there, can my students now measure what it actually is using uh, pH and alkalinity to see, can we, can we actually tell that? Hmm, I wonder how that happened. The water has been off. Someone. And somebody flipped the magic switch. So we're going to try it out and see if it's working. All right. I always to see it the wrong way. There we go. Look at that delicious yeah. Yeah. Hey, that was yeah. perfect water for keeping cephalopods, right, I think? Because it was pumped right from the bay. It is it is their home. And what's cool is we can't see them in it, so they feel more comfortable like they're in their natural, natural environment. <laughs> exactly. some article that was going off about how you can't really be vegetarian because most of the fertilizer given to the plants is animal derived and so the plants are eating animals and so no, you're eating animals no, by proxy no, yeah. No, 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 yeah 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 no, bad I wish no, I should go because this. animal protein is conserved when it gets to the plant right no uh, okay so they didn't even go to that level it was oh. just if what you eat is eating animals. Yeah. Yeah. I know. But it's here's the thing, you can't you can't be a vegetarian if you drink water because it's probably been peed out by something somewhere. 